Hello and welcome to another episode of Addicted to Business. Today is my huge honor to welcome Mr. Jay Bear to the show. Hi, Jay. How are you doing? Fantastic to be here. I'm also addicted to business, so this show is off to a great start already. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for joining us. Of course, no show would be complete without my good friend and co-host, Mr. Stokely Howard. Hello, thanks, for the, uh, thanks for the kind intro, uh, Nave, and thank you, Jay, for joining us today. I appreciate your time. You bet, Stokely. So for those that don't know Jay, a Hall of Fame keynote speaker talking about motivational business growth. He normally covers topics, marketing, customer experience, customer service, word of mouth marketing, the list goes on. It's a huge honor for us to have him on the show. And so for the next 45 minutes, we're gonna dive into all things customer service, all things customer experience, and how you as a listener can get more from your customers. So Jay, let me start with this. As an International Hall of Fame marketing and customer experience keynote speaker, author of six best-selling books, the list goes on. What I want to know from you is, where did this all start for you? Well, you know, I, I actually started, uh, and this is almost like scary to say now, I started in politics. I started <laughs> as a political campaign consultant uh, here in the States running uh, campaigns for, for uh, election. I did that for, I was a, a, that's what I studied in, in university was politics. And so I did that for a couple of years and then realized that that was a, a fairly ugly business and it's much, much uglier now than it was <laughs> in those days. Uh, but I got out of politics and got into what we would consider to be traditional marketing. And I started to work, uh, work for several large companies in marketing. And then I sort of accidentally got involved in digital marketing way, 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 way back guys uh, in 1993 when domain names were still free. You could get register whatever domain name you wanted and just have it because who would want a website? <laughs> it was almost 30 years ago. And so uh, I started there and, and started a whole series of, uh, of digital marketing, customer experience and customer uh, service exercises. And, and, you know, I've had the pleasure to work with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of companies uh, over the last, I guess, be almost 28 years. Um, so it wasn't really like one thing that got me started. Although I will tell you this, Nate, that, that uh, I am a seventh generation entrepreneur, right? So my family has had their own businesses back into the early 1800s. My son is now an eighth generation entrepreneur. And, and so the idea that you would need to figure out a way to take care of your customers wasn't even something that I ever had a conversation with my father about. It was just sort of in the air. You know, I, I grew up going to my grandfather's store and things like that. And you just sort of get raised in that environment. And it's just sort of part of your personality and kind of the things that you think, you know? Sure. Mm -hmm. Um incredible story and i'm sure that i'm sure you've had a i'm sure it's been a bit of a roller coaster and there's <laughs> many things that you haven't told us uh, in, in that short amount of time Indeed. There, <laughs> everyone has that i used to work down. i used to work as a spokesman for the prison system that's one of the things i haven't told you yet that's, <laughs> that, is, that, that is totally true back? that is true <laughs> yeah, it's a fun job. Yeah, <laughs> I imagine so. Um, one of the key points that you, you often talk about, Jay, uh, is around uh, giving customers a, a differentiated uh, experience uh, that they notice and, and talk about more, more than anything. Uh, tell us, tell us more about this. I think everybody would agree that the best way to grow any business is for your customers to grow it for you. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite quotes in the history of business is from Robert Stevens. Robert Stevens is the founder of Geek Squad, which is the services arm of the Best Buy electronics retail chain. And many years ago, Robert said that advertising is a tax paid by the unremarkable. Advertising is a tax paid by the unremarkable. Now, there is a time and a place for advertising. So I don't agree entirely with his statement. But it is also true that many of the most successful businesses in the world advertise the least, not the most, because their customers do that for them. I think everybody understands that word of mouth is important, but yet, Stokely, the crazy thing is that nobody actually does anything about it. One of the things that I found in the research from my most recent book, Talk Triggers, is that fewer than 1% of businesses have an actual word of mouth strategy. Okay. Everybody just takes it for granted. You, people just figure like, all right, look, if I run a good business, <clears throat> people will notice that and tell people about it. Yeah. But that's not how people work, right? That's not how, that's not how anybody is wired psychologically. Like I, I've had, I don't know, man, like maybe 
I'm going to say seven accountants in my career. Here's a story I've never told. Hey, Stokely, check it out. I got my tax return back. All the numbers added up, <laughs> right? Nobody's going to tell a story if you do exactly what they paid you to do. Yeah. <laughs> That's not a story, right? So if you want to unlock word of mouth, and trust me, you do, you have to do something that creates a conversation. Mm. And that only happens when the customer's experience with your business is different than what they expected. Yeah. It has to be different than what they expected. Competency does not create conversations. I love that. It's almost like a, a, a more adversity does, right? But in, in its own way. That's right. Yeah. And that's why if you look at reviews, right? And what is a review? A review is word of mouth asynchronous. Yeah. If you look at reviews, most reviews are one star or five star. Why? Because that experience was somehow different than what you expected. So true. Nobody leaves a three star review because it's not worthy of conversation. Yeah. Bang average, bang in the middle. <laughs> so, Jay, I'm interested to hear, you wrote a guide on getting traction and success. I was doing some research uh, about you and you, like I say, you wrote this guide about getting traction and success from virtual events. Mm, now, yeah. A lot of people listening today with the global pandemic and everything else have been forced. Oh, there's a pandemic? Them. Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, when this comes out, I hope Tell me more. Tell me more. <laughs> We've all just been told to wash our hands for three months. <laughs> yeah, put it in the time capsule. So I'm really hoping that actually, yeah, when this comes out, maybe not so relevant, but at the same time, right now, certainly for Stokely and I, what are the keys to success for those virtual events? Because everyone's doing it, it's becoming incredibly saturated and actually it's difficult to cut through the noise. Yeah, it's, it's challenging because of course, without the opportunity in many cases to do physical events, you have every business of every size, shape and description, especially in B2B, rushing in and embracing more virtual events. And so there's more and more and more and more and more and more webinars and, and online summits and, you know, video streams and similar kind of productions. Um, I saw a stat recently that said that 50% uh, of marketers would rather give up internet access for an entire weekend then go to just one more webinar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, well, there you go. But, I feel uh, the same. I'm in that yeah, bucket. <laughs> yeah. So there you go. Uh, so what you've got to do is, is, is say, look, uh, how can we change the form or the format to make it innovative in a way that, that people haven't maybe experienced it? So one of the things that we do in my company, we actually pioneered this four years ago and have a trademark on it and everything. It's called a Web9 it's a webinar in just nine minutes. So most webinars are 45 or 60 minutes. We do the whole thing in nine minutes. Open, do the content, couple of questions out, right? And people love it because, you know, everybody's got 10 minutes in their day. And if you can't make it live, you're much more likely to watch a nine minute replay than a 60 minute replay. So that's one of the things we do differently. Uh, three weeks ago, I did a session with Terminus, um, the B2B uh, account-based marketing software company, marketing and margaritas. So instead of doing it middle of the day, as almost all these events are, we did it during happy hour, at least uh, for, for where I am in the Eastern part of the U S and literally drank tequila on the program. And we did 50% uh, content about account-based marketing and 50% tequila and agave trivia. And I actually <laughs> sent tequila to the winners. It was awesome, man. So, you know, you, it's just like the word of mouth question, Stokely, like um, same is lame. Love that. And, Love and, that. If, and if your idea is, all right, let's just play follow the leader, you're gonna have a real hard time right now. You gotta have the courage to do something different because nobody wants to sit in on the exact same kind of webinar that they have <laughs> you know, 114 times uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. So true. I just wrote that down because I love that saying. <laughs> we're, we're as a business, we're in the process of rebranding, and and we're like, do we go completely different? Do we just go out there? And and that just summed it up for me. We're definitely going to go out there. <laughs> um, getting to your your first million dollar or, or million pounds uh, turnover is often quite a, a monumental uh, landmark or achievement for many entrepreneurs. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but you have founded five multi -do uh, million dollar companies. Mm -hmm. what's, yes. the, what's the secret? Is there a secret sauce? Is there a secret button? 
Not really. I think the secret is, uh, it's not a secret. I'm going to tell you right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was a secret until this. Uh, well, it was a secret until this show. Thanks, Excuse guys. <laughs> um, appreciate it. Yeah, show's over. Uh, no, it's, it's only two things. One, uh, three things. Having been, almost all my ideas and businesses have been somehow in digital, okay? I have a huge advantage in that, as I said, I've been doing this since like the internet was invented almost. Uh, so, so I have the benefit of, of, of seeing all of this evolution. And so I'm probably aware of what's going to happen before the customers are aware of what's going to happen, right? So I sort of yeah. have, the, I have the advantage of foresight. So that's number one. Number two, I am not at all afraid to change and reinvent what I sell and to whom. In fact, my team would say uh, that is the thing about me that drives them crazy is that I am, I'm never ever uh, satisfied and I never stop iterating, right? So literally on a every 60 to 90 day basis, we spin up a whole different new service to sell to different clients for different circumstances, right? We're just making things up all the time because we are a strategy firm. We, we don't actually have anything to sell other than what's between our ears. So we're constantly reinventing what that looks like and how it's priced and how it's packaged and how we describe it. And then the third thing is I think because of my, my family background and sort of how I was raised, uh, I, I feel like I've got a really good, and I, this isn't some sort of skill set. It just kind of is. Um, I, I just have an innate understanding of what customers want and kind of where their mindset is. Like what, what's their actual fear? What's their actual pain? What are they actually scared about? And then how can we solve that for them in, in some way? Um, so it's kind of a combination of, of history and flexibility, I guess is how I would describe it. Love that. That is the secret right there. <laughs> Jay, I'm interested to know, you wrote about creating customers through word of mouth in your book, Talk Triggers, back in 2018. We touched on that a little bit earlier, but actually let's dive into that a bit further because far too many people neglect word of mouth as a channel and just take it for granted. What else can you share with us in terms of word of mouth strategy that people listening can take away from today's episode and go, okay, we will now go and implement this from today. Well, I would tell you that when, when, when you discuss word of mouth, what a lot of people think of in business is uh, going viral, right? That you're going to do something that creates this big spike of conversations and that's going to be your salvation. And that is not at all what I'm talking about. I don't have a philosophical opposition to that kind of public relations stunt. It's just that the impact of that kind of thing on your business is going to be by definition, very short term. Yeah. What I'm talking about is an operational differentiation that you include in your business and make available to all customers forever Mm. So that the largest possible percentage of your customers has an opportunity to tell your story to people that they know. So I'll give you an example. A lot of times when people are thinking about word of mouth, not only do they say, hey, let's go viral, which is not the right approach, but they say, oh, okay, you want us to do something different, Jay. So what we're going to do is we're going to have this cool giveaway or whatever, and we are going to make sure that our biggest customers, our longest tenured customers or our brand new customers have access to that. Okay. And that's not how you should do that because if, if you're, if the idea here is to maximize the number of conversations about you, and that is the idea, then why would you truncate that by only making your differentiator available to a subset of your customer base, your biggest customers, your newest customers, or your oldest customers. The best talk triggers, the best operational differentiators are those that are available to all customers. I'll give you an example, if I may. There's a, a restaurant in, uh, in California, Sacramento, California, uh, called Skip's Kitchen. And, and Skip's is a very, you know, it's not noteworthy. They have good hamburgers, but a lot of restaurants have good hamburgers. Uh, but they, it's a counter service place. So you walk in, there's a menu board, 
uh, above the cash register and you say, okay, I want a cheeseburger and I want uh, fries and I want a chocolate shake. And then when your food is ready, they bring it out to you. We've all been to restaurants like that. That's not worthy of a story either. Mm. Good food, fine. But this restaurant has a line to get in every day. Skip and his wife have been in business for almost 12 years now. They have spent a grand total of $0 on advertising ever in the history of the business. Their secret is that they have a talk trigger. They have an operational differentiator that every customer has access to. Here's how it works. You go in, you order cheeseburger, fries, chocolate shake. After you order, but before you pay, the front desk person, front counter help person, whips out a deck of playing cards from underneath the counter and fans them out face down in front of you and looks you dead in the eye and says, pick a card. <laughs> and you're like, what? And you pick a card. And if you get a joker, your entire meal is free whether you've ordered for just yourself or an entire football club. Right. Now on average, about four people a day win this game. And when they win, they go crazy. They're calling their mom crying. They're putting reviews on, <laughs> on Google, like a confetti cannon. It's, it's a whole thing, but it's not about the four winners. It's the fact that everybody who orders gets to play. Okay. So what a lot of people would say is that that's a great idea. What we're going to do is uh, we're, we're slower on Tuesday. So let's only do that on Tuesdays. Or, or if it's your birthday, you get to play the game. No, every customer, every time, because you're trying to maximize the number of people who can tell the story. I love love that. Is, is there another example. example out? So I'm just thinking for those listening, we'll have some in the tourism space and therefore they can look at something uh, again, different, but at the same time, that theme. But actually, is there something tech folks? I'm just thinking for Stokely and I and our businesses, obviously we probably couldn't do that kind of thing. Have you seen examples in our space where it's worked? Absolutely. Uh, do you know the business um, Uber Conference? I, I don't think no, they aware. Uber Conference is a free uh, voice and video calling service. So like a, like a Skype, I guess I would, I would yeah. call it. They've been around for a long time. There are, I don't know, a 12, 15, I don't know, a lot of companies do the exact same thing. Yeah. A lot. They do the exact same thing. Also, it's free. Kind of hard to compete on price when everybody is free. <laughs> yeah. Tough. yeah. Everybody does the exact same thing and free. So how do you succeed? Well, what's the worst part of a conference call? Waiting on hold for everybody else to join the call. Yeah. Historically, Everybody has, as their on hold music, smooth jazz, right? A lot of saxophone, <laughs> a little piano, very Kenny G, right? That's kind of like the, the on hold uh, soundtrack, right? Yeah. Well, Uber Conference uh, decided to do something different as a technology software company. Their CEO, who also happens to be a musician, wrote and recorded a hilarious song about all the trials and tribulations of waiting on hold. It's like this whole song about this guy who comes to the call and he's like, where is everybody? It's after the time it's supposed to start. And so he leaves the call and then everybody else shows up, right? Which we've all probably experienced that. It's really funny. It's a very catchy tune as well. So much so it's actually been covered by real rock stars. <laughs> this is their differentiator. If you actually go to Twitter and search Uber conference plus on hold, you will see hundreds of tweets from people who say, yeah, I like the service, but I'm here for the on hold music. This is why I am a customer. It is the secret largely of their success because they're just not afraid to do something uh, different. <laughs> um, I love that. I'm trying to think of something. I'm trying to think of something now um, that, that, that we can bring into our space, Nate. I'm sure there is something. Um, Many uh, many will listen to this show and think that their their customer experience or their customer service is okay and 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 it's almost sort of you know above their head really um, and and they they're totally involved in their business that they don't actually realise that there's that you know that potentially it isn't. Um, is there a way of ranking your score or your, or your existing level to then identify where you need to improve your customer service? 
Well, there's lots of, of customer service metrics that have been used in business. The, the one that's used most frequently and the one that we use in my organization is net promoter score or a version of that, which you may be familiar with. It was originally designed uh, by Fred Reichold and, um, and the Bain organization, uh, consulting firm Bain. And, and it's the one we've, you've all seen it, you know, on a, on a scale of zero to nine, how likely are you to recommend this business to your friends or colleagues? Mm. Net Promoter Score has uh, its detractors because it it is a fairly blunt object, right? You're you're trying to sum up an entire relationship with one score, mm. but it is a nice mechanism because the willingness to recommend or the willingness to promote a business certainly is a um, a good measure of overall satisfaction and success. And it's nice because you can use that number. If you ask the question the same way, every time you can use that number and track it over time, which is why a lot of companies use net promoter score as their kind of key metric for customer satisfaction. You can say, you know, this month we are at a 62 and next month we're at a 65 and the month after that we're at a 71. And so you can actually gut check it over time. So I, it, it's not without its detractors or, or without its uh, faults, but but I think that's probably the best number to use. Now, one of the things I talked about in my book, Hug Your Haters, is in a, in a straight customer service scenario, not an overall relationship measure, but a customer service measure, is to ask customers after the transaction, after you answer a question or you get live chat support or some other kind of help. Yeah. On a scale of zero to nine, how difficult was it for you to get your question answered or to get assistance, right? It's almost like measuring hassle um, as opposed to satisfaction. Yeah. So from a pure customer service perspective, I like that metric quite a bit. Yeah. So for our company, the way you do net promoter score is you, you take, um, uh, you take the, 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 the eights and nines and then you, um, uh, and then you subtract um, the, the zeros, the fives, and then you sort of move the decimal place over. So for my company, Convince and Convert, our net promoter score uh, is 78, um, which is really high. It's higher than the Ritz-Carlton. It's higher than Apple. It's higher than uh, a lot of brands. We're really proud of that, of our level of customer satisfaction. We don't get it right every time. Nobody can. Uh, but, we, but we definitely track it and pay attention to it. Now, we don't have that many customers, right? So that's the other challenge, right? You know, when you, when you don't have that many data points um, as a consultancy, you know, we may work with 50 clients a year. You know, if you get two unhappy customers, it changes your score quite a bit, which is one of the other challenges with a metric like that. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not a level playing field for every business, right? Yeah. So Jay, taking it back down to real basics for some of those there that ha haven't yet been exposed to MPS scores and essentially mm -hmm. are shooting a bit in the dark. What are the top five things that someone can implement from today to say, actually, you know what, if we're going to do nothing other than listen to this and then go and implement mm -hmm. five things, this is what we're going to do to transform our customer experience. One, I guess, would be finding that point of differentiation. But what else could people do? I'll give you three because we've done a lot of research on this. Yeah. Um, what, you're trying to, what you're trying to come up with is what I like to call the coveted customer experience. Coveted customer experience, CCX. And when you have a coveted customer experience, what the, what the outcome of that is, is that you deliver a customer experience to your customers that it's so good that price and perfection are no longer required. Meaning that you don't have to be the cheapest. And importantly, if you screw something up, they won't immediately leave. Yeah. Price and perfection are no longer required. That's what happens when you deliver a coveted customer experience. So, Nath, to your question, well, how do you do that? Well, the problem with customer experience, and I'm going to go on a little bit of a rant here for a second. The problem with customer experience is that it doesn't actually exist. Hear me out. Go on. <laughs> customer experience is how we make our customers feel. How we make them feel. Problem is... Even in simple businesses, there are dozens of things that impact that feeling. In complex businesses, it may be hundreds. It is everything that you do. It's your website, it's your email, it's how you answer the phone, it's what does a box look like, what do the receipts look like, and on and on and on and on and on and on and on, right? It is 
tons of different touch points have an impact on how customers feel. The challenge with that is if I say, make your customer experience better or like, um, okay, but I got dozens of touch points, which ones do I impact? So when I say customer experience doesn't exist, it's because really customer experience is just a nickname, right? It's just, it's just a term that we use as a catch-all to describe the totality of those dozens or hundreds of individual touch points. It's a shortcut, right? Yeah. So the real question isn't get better at customer experience. The real question is what specifically should you do that will change how customers think about your business so that price and perfection no longer matter. So I've done a ton of research on this point. There are three things that really, 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 really matter to customers. And they are these. First, you've gotta be quick. Speed is a huge expectation, more all the time, and a giant differentiator. If you can find a way to be 15% faster in every customer interaction, regardless, chat, text, phone, email, hostage note, skywriting, whatever, what, all the different things that you go back and forth with customers. If you can be 15% faster, that will definitely help. Quick is the first one. The second one is clear. How can you be 15% less confusing to your customers? One of the things that the pandemic has done is changed how people buy products and services, have changed the nature of a lot of products and services to the degree that nobody knows nothing about nothing anymore right? Nobody, I had to get my hair cut a couple months ago for the first time. I'm a 50 year old man. I figured I understood how haircuts work. Nope, not anymore. <laughs> haircut place still open. The lady who cuts my hair, does she still work there? Appointments the same length of time? Is there a waiting room? Do I wear a mask? Does she wear a mask? Do they still shampoo your hair? Do they still sell gel? How do I pay now with filthy paper currency or can I tap to pay? Do I have to text when I get there? Do the parking meters downtown still work? And on and on and on and on. Nobody knows nothing about nothing. There's an uncertainty gap now that has, hasn't happened since the internet was invented, right? You know way more about your business than your customers do, more than ever. So being clear is hugely important. Informing your customers more than ever. That's a, a, the second piece. And the third is to be kind. It's quick, clear, and kind. We are living in an era right now of empathy deficit. I am old enough to remember a time when treating customers with dignity and humanity and respect and kindness, we didn't actually have a name for that because we just called it business <laughs> because it was the default state. That's, that's, that is what you did. Now that's no longer the default. And that makes me a little sad, frankly. But, and it would make my grandfather super pissed, but <laughs> the good news is you can now really stand out from your competition just by being the kindest, most empathetic player in your category in whatever that means in your business. So how can you be 15% more empathetic to your customers? So Nathan, that's the formula. You want a coveted customer experience. And to do that, you want to be 15% more quick, 15% more clear, and 15% more kind. Do that in the next 90 days, watch the money roll in. I, I love that. I'm going to implement that from today. <laughs> right on. <laughs> scribbling notes. <laughs> yeah, I have actually wrote quite a few notes. <laughs> Always learning from this podcast, even though we host it. Um, Jay, uh, you, you have worked with some of the world's uh, largest brands and, and I'm sure many uh, SMEs uh, over your time too. Um, are there any other, are there, are there, I'm guessing they are, but from, from your point of view, are there common pitfalls you see when it comes to, to customer service and content marketing in particular? Well, on the customer service side, one of the challenges, especially for SMEs, is people take it personally. Yeah. And I totally get it. Like, I, it happens to me too. Like, I run a small business and I have my whole life. Um, when somebody tells you, when a customer tells you they're not happy and you're working in an SME environment, it feels like somebody is telling you that your baby is ugly. <laughs> and yeah. nobody wants to hear that, <laughs> even if they know for a fact that their baby is ugly. <laughs> <Love that. laughs> so it becomes very personal. Yeah, and, yeah. and that's why a lot of times, I talk about this a lot in my book, Hug Your Haters, 
a, a lot of times when business owners, managers respond to customers, when customers are unhappy, they make it way worse because it becomes personal. And, and we actually talked to some psychiatrists uh, for that book. And what they told me was fascinating. They said, when you are confronted with negativity and you feel like you have some skin in the game, it actually triggers a change in your brain chemistry. Hmm. And it creates the exact same phenomenon in your head as the fight or flight reflex. So if somebody leaves you a negative review or a customer sends you an email that says, Stokely, I'm really unhappy with Nathan. And I'm sure you get that email a lot. Um, <laughs> Twice a day. <laughs> what, it, what, it, what it feels like is somebody pulled a knife on you, right? Yeah, that's yeah. the same sort of brain chemistry. So that's the, the, the best advice I can give on customer service for SMEs is like, look, you don't know what the actual deal is with that client, right? Mm. They, you know, they could be having the worst day of their lives, especially right now, like crazy stuff's going on, right? So you, you could just be caught in the crossfire. Mm. So don't take it negatively until you have a chance to really talk to them and see what's up. And, and then, you know, obviously getting somebody on the phone or face-to-face -face is way better than hashing it out via email. You know, everybody gets a little um, bold on a keyboard. Mm. And then when you get on the phone, you're like, oh, that wasn't that bad. So yeah. definitely try and get them on the phone if you can. I feel like as well over, over writing and an email is so easy to misunderstand the emotion behind words. Yep. Um, that happens in everyday life for me as well, not just business, you know? I, I make so much more use now of video email than I ever have. I send a ton of short videos. Right. I use uh, Go Video from Vidyard for that. There's a few other providers out there. Uh, whether I'm communicating to my team or clients, anything that I want to make sure that there's no miscommunication or lack of nuance, I'll yeah. just shoot a quick 45 second video. Here you go. I just, I just feel like it's way better. Uh, ironically, it's more likely to be viewed that way than leaving somebody a voicemail because nobody actually wants to use their phone anymore. <laughs> so true. <laughs> yeah, I'm interested to talk about another one of your publications. We've talked, to, talked about it a little bit, and this is Hugging Your Haters. And I was fascinated by this because having grown up in the world of tourism and hospitality, we have tools like TripAdvisor where actually it's seen as the devil because you get these keyboard warriors that can come on and say all sorts about your business and you have almost no right to respond or certainly many businesses see it as a real negative. But actually your book talks about how you can embrace that and actually negative reviews don't have to be such a bad thing. Tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, we do a lot of work in tourism as well. In fact, California tourism is one of our clients. We've done a lot of work for um, several other states and, and, and Hilton Hotels is a client and several others. So we, we, we know what you mean. Um, this idea that a negative review is bad for your business is not true. A negative review that you don't answer is bad for your business because it shows that you don't care what customers think. So the hug your haters advice in that book is to answer every customer in every channel, every time, every customer, every channel, every time, every tweet, every review, every Facebook post, every email, every voicemail. Have you guys ever complained about a business? Either of you? Um, All the time. <laughs> yeah. But interestingly more through word of mouth, but yeah, definitely. Have you ever complained to a business, send them an email, voicemail, review, and didn't hear anything back? Yes. Yeah. Did that make you feel better? No. <laughs> I guess it there does. You You're kind of offloading in a way, but. No, but yeah, I mean, not hearing back you, from doesn't make you feel better, no, right? What so, a response, so, of course. Right? Like, yeah. And even more yeah. time trying to sort it and you don't get the feedback and you're just like, well. This makes you feel worse. Yeah. Here's the, here's the most important thing to understand. Customer service is a spectator sport. Mm. If somebody complains about your business online, what that means, especially in a review site, everybody can see it. <laughs> so yeah. it's not just about Nathan was unhappy with his, you know, fish and chips. Everybody who saw that review, A, knows that he's unhappy, but B, is looking to see if the fish and chip stand responds and then if they do, how they handle it. And that has an impact, not just on Nathan's likelihood to return, but on all these other people. Mm -hmm. 
reviews are marketing. How you handle reviews is a huge part of the upper funnel consideration set. And it's especially true uh, for Gen Z. There's a brand new book out um, called Z Economy or Z Economy um, here in the States from my friend Jason Dorsey. And he's the number one researcher on uh, Generation Z. And he told me yesterday, I had him on my podcast, and he said that um, the average Gen Z consumer will read between 20 and 40 reviews before making a purchase. Wow. Yeah. So if everybody's like, yeah, the fish and chips sucked and you don't say anything about it, or you say, well, how dare you, Nathan? Our fish and chips are amazing, right? You get all, you get all yeah, angry yeah. about it. Yeah. Um, it's not about the person who complained. It's about the spectators. It's about all the people looking on. So every time somebody says something about you, positive or negative, online in a way that has archival value, like a review, it's actually a huge opportunity. Mm -hmm. It's like an opportunity for you to then turn that into something that tells people, oh, these guys are awesome, mm -hmm. right? I love how they handled that. What a great business. So it's, it's uh, people just think about it upside down in most cases. Um, do you know what, that, that actually, you, you're talking about something that literally happened to me the other day, it's so strange. Um, this restaurant who have a rooftop bar where we live, um, a lady commented on there saying that- But she, you don't live in the rooftop bar, it's no, the restaurant the is, bar. okay, I just yeah. wanted to, <laughs> a little, little clarity there on the state, yeah, yeah. okay. The good. restaurant and the bar was on the rooftop and, and this lady left a, a negative review saying um, that they wouldn't let her dog up there, even though it was outside. And uh, the owner replied to the comment and um, basically said, well, think about it. Why can't we have dogs in restaurants? It makes so much sense. And this lady was just giving a review. Anyway, the local press picked up on it and it just did them so well because it's just like a common yep. sense answer. It's like, yes. of course you can't have a dog in a restaurant. Don't really Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, and look, my friend Shep Hyken, who's a terrific uh, customer service author and expert, uh, has a saying that goes like this, a customer whose complaint you ignore is a customer you should be prepared to lose. Yeah. Yeah. Makes I mean, if you don't say anything, then you're basically like, well, all right, peace out. Yeah. <laughs> and, and if that's how you want to run your business, that's fine. And a lot of people do because most businesses don't have their math right they think it's way easier than it actually is to replace that customer. Yeah. It's an opportunity. Right. Like you said, it's an opportunity for marketing as well, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. I've got a lot of examples in that Hug Your Haters book about how to say things the right way um, and, and sort of turn customers um, into, into advocates, et cetera. Yeah. You mentioned a little bit there about your podcast. Just quickly tell us a little bit more about the podcast. Yeah. Uh, my podcast is called Social Pros. Uh, we've been doing weekly episodes since... Uh, January of 2012. So we're, we're uh, hunting in on episode 450. Um, each week, my co-host and I interview, usually it's somebody who runs a social media for a big brand, right? So we've had the, the guy who runs social media for Wells Fargo or, uh, or uh, MIT or Square or Delta Airlines or what have you. And so each week we interview somebody and then occasionally we'll have authors on who have written books about um, topics of interest to social media professionals. So it's a really interesting show and we, we kind of get in the weeds, right? We talk about, all right, how are you handling paid social? How do you handle influencers? What are you doing about Instagram reels? It's not a tactics show, it's a strategy show, uh, but it's, uh, you learn a lot from these big companies who have huge staffs in some cases and what they're doing. Uh, it's now one of the top 15 marketing podcasts of all time, uh, according to Apple Podcasts. So it's got a, a large audience, it's a lot of fun to do. That's very cool. And how did you build it on the topic of podcasts? Many people listening here will be thinking that podcasts form part of their content strategy. Yeah. What would be your kind of two or three main tips to growing the podcast? Is it just consistency? You said you've been doing it there for like eight years almost. Yeah. I mean, certainly consistency uh, is, is part of it, but I think more than that, especially now because there's you know enormously more podcasts than when I started and my team and I have produced probably 20 podcasts, both for ourselves and for our clients. So we do a lot of work in that area. Here's the key. If you're gonna have a successful podcast or a successful video series or a successful blog, it has to be somebody's favorite version of that thing in the world, mm -hmm. period. Not everybody's favorite, that's impossible. But if your show isn't somebody's favorite, 
then it's not sharp enough, right? It's not, it's not specific enough, right? There's a reason why our show focuses on big brands because most podcasts in social media don't, mm. et cetera, right? So the problem that most people find is when they start a new episodic content execution, whether it's audio, video, blog, what have you, is they say, we need to maximize the size of our audience. So we're gonna make one episode about X and a different episode about Y and another episode about M because they're trying to kind of touch all these bases and not offend anybody or, or not um, be too specific. And that's the exact opposite approach, right? You're better off being narrower, narrower than you are being broad. And that sounds counterintuitive, but mm -hmm. the only way you're gonna be a must listen is if you're specific enough where some people say this, this is the show for me. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of times, a lot, a lot of podcasts fail in, in the strategy more so than the execution. Love that. Love that. Um, uh, Jay, I'm conscious of time and um, I really appreciate your time on the, on the podcast today. And I, and I want to leave with, with this question, knowing what you know now is if you could turn back clocks, what would you have done differently? And why? Well, I am a, a tequila collector. I would have started drinking tequila a lot earlier, for sure. <laughs> um, for sure. I do like tequila. Uh, I, would have, I would have given up beer for tequila earlier. Um, I, I would have bought Amazon earlier, Amazon stock earlier, for sure. Um, although I have a cool coffee mug. I'm sure it's a collector's item. Uh, I got a coffee mug that Amazon sent me. Uh, I don't even know, well over a decade ago for being one of the first 500 Amazon customers ever in the history of the company. Really? <laughs> uh, yeah, so they'll probably worth something someday. I don't know. Um, no, I think I would, I would say um, if I had to kind of turn back the clock on myself and provide some advice, it would be to embrace risk earlier. Mm. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with risk now, but it's easier to do that because I've had some success. And so failure doesn't, isn't going to sink the boat. And I'll tell you a quick story if we could. We got four minutes. Yeah. yeah. All right. So as you know, uh, I come from a, a family of entrepreneurs. And so I never had a conversation with my parents about, well, when, when are you going to start a business? It just, there, we never had that conversation because it was just always sort of assumed. And I always wanted to, like, I really always wanted to start my own thing. Uh, obviously, I'm kind of born to it in that regard. But I didn't until um, fairly late in my career, actually. I was um, nearly, let's see, I was, yeah, 30 years old before I started my own company with my own money and, and like my own brand new thing, right? And so for the previous decade, from the time I was say 20 to the time I was 30, I really wanted to do that. I wanted to start my own thing, but I didn't. I was scared. I was too scared. Um, and I was getting paid pretty well, you know, um, as an executive or as a partner or whatever. And so that was part of it. I was like, well, you know, what if I start my own company and it doesn't go well and, and it fails, then what? You know, and at that point I had a little, I had a baby daughter at home and a wife and a house and a car. And I'm like, man, I, I, you know, why, why risk it? And one day, my best friend called me. He and I had been, uh, had been best mates since we were in um, grade two. Such good friends, in fact, that he married my wife's sister. <laughs> <laughs> so best friend became my brother-in-law, which Does I totally recommend. <laughs> you totally recommend that. If you can pull that off, do that. It's, it's awesome. It makes, it makes family gatherings a lot more fun. Uh, so I was 30. He was 30. I was scared to start a new business. And he called me. And he said, I just got back from the doctor and I have brain cancer. And I walked in the next morning and I quit and I've never worked for anybody since. Because I realized like, what am I actually scared of? Like, okay, I start a company uh, or I take some risk and it doesn't work out. Well, I'll go get a job working for somebody else, making the same money I'm making now. Like what, what am I, I'm not going to die right? What, what's my actual risk here? Um, and so I didn't do anything until I was 30 and I'm 50 now. And I probably robbed myself of five years as an entrepreneur um, because I was scared. And although we lost my best friend and brother-in-law, Al, 
um, I'll, I'll always be grateful for that because he gave me the push I needed to, uh, uh, to become an entrepreneur myself. Wow. What an incredible story, Jay. Um, thank you so much for your knowledge and, and the value that you've gave to our audience today. It's uh, hugely appreciated. That was a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Great job on the show, guys. Thank you, Jay. <laughs> Look after yourself. For everyone that's listening, I hope you've enjoyed it. Please tune into our next episode. Before you do, just check us out on uh, Apple Podcasts and make sure you leave us a review. Jay, lovely to meet you. Really appreciate your time. Stoker, as always, thank you for joining us and we look forward to seeing you on the next show. Thanks, Jay. You bet.